And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Spiral Lane Productions, the madman beh behind Meteor Tales as well as Grimstone, and coming back with a, revi a revival of Meteor Tales subtitled Age of Grit, the one and only Angelos Kripanios. How you, are you doing today? Hey, man. I'm fine. How are you? Thank you for having me again. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on. Um, congratulations on ma on managing to get um, twenty six hundred euros for the yeah. Kickstarter for Meteor Tales. Thank you, man. Uh, and thank thanks as well for being pa for being patient with with me through time zone confusion and the. Um, the bit, the bit of luck that co that caused us to delay this. No, no worries. Uh, we uh, adventurers know the problems with space-time continuum, so no worries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as much as I would like to to share the same time zone with my guests, that's not possible. <laughs> I know. Not not unless I feel like taking flights every other day. Yeah. So. When it comes to so when it comes to age of when it comes to age of grit, I think the first thing I'd like to delve into is: Do you consider this a second edition of Meteor Tales, or do you consider this a revised? Okay, uh, thank you for asking. I, I would like to to clarify this. Um, I have a small section in the first page of the book that explains the the history of Meteor Tales. So actually. This would be the third Meteor Tales installment, mm -hmm. uh, which means that there was a first edition, which was a pilot print only for a few people, just for friends and some other guests. And so that was the first edition. And it was called Meteor Tales of Lore Untold. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I launched the uh, second edition of Meteor Tales, which is the actually the previous edition, the one that... Uh, you first came across, mm -hmm. and we started talking, and you wrote about it, and you and you reviewed it, reviewed it, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And now we've got Meta Tales: Age of Grid, which is a it's a third Meta Tales game, but it's completely autonomous and it's a new thing. The only th common element is it, it shares some aesthetics, and of course the lore of the world of Italia. Mm -hmm. The lore stays the same, the mechanics are different. All right, that makes that certainly makes sense. So, was this now? I do remember. At, I do remember at the time um, covering me, when I covered Meteor Tales Second Edition. Um, one of the things I had remarked was was it was have was it having some having some very strong ideas but needing some refinement, and then um, obviously with Grimstone, I was able to see. A more ref a more refined experience, and I'm get I'm guessing that progression is holding true with um, Meteor Tales, especially with the grit system that's at its core. Hopefully, yes. I mean that was that's what I was going for as well, mm -hmm. and I believe that with experience and time, I get to this point that I can make um, systems that make sense. They are not very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh. at the same time, they've got a lot of things to offer. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's what I, I believe I made with um, this new game. That I, I believe I merged some of the good elements of a, of the previous Metal Tales with, a, with, with an easy-to-follow approach, mm -hmm. something like that. Now, speaking of that, let's talk about the grit system. Yes. Um, how did how did the idea for it come about? Well, um, to be honest, I was playing the previous edition of Metal Tales with my friends, and although I enjoyed playing it, and other people that still play the game now because it has developed some following, um, seem to enjoy it. 
I, I wanted to try another approach with a, with a lighter setting. And I had some ideas in my mind that were too different to just revise the previous edition, you know. So I started building a new one. Mm -hmm. And then and then I, I decided to create a system, uh, which actually became the grid system, that um, didn't have some elements that always annoyed me. For example, I don't like modifiers. I don't like adding uh, numbers when I roll. I don't like... I, I wanted to find a universal mechanic that is easy and can apply to everything without modifiers, but without losing the depth that modifiers add, you know, because you need modifiers to differentiate, for example, uh, things, uh, weapons, damage, and stuff like that. Uh, environmental factors and I wanted to find a common ground when where I can calculate everything without that adding a bunch of numbers and doing calculations mm -hmm. because I hate losing time over calculate calculations mm -hmm. um, and that's how I started the, developing the grid system and if you allow me I can explain how it works in a very simple manner uh, le yeah, let's get into let's get into that since that is going to be one of the things at the crux of um, Age of Grit. I can I can I can follow your qu questions, of course, if you want, or I can explain briefly whatever you prefer. Let's let's go. I'd say we should go into a brief explanation before we go into any specifics. Okay, so the grid system is a um, universal. Um, how do you say? Bar, a meter, how do you call it? Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a metric system anyway. So the, que the concept is that you have one thing to monitor, your grid, okay? And uh, this, uh, let's say, energy bar, the grid bar, affects the performance of your character. So it's not exactly hit points. It's everything combined. It's hit points. It's uh, morale. It's... Uh, it's everything in one. Mm -hmm. So, to make it extremely simple, um, when your character uh, is well, uh, I mean, when you start a combat, for example, uh, you have, let's say, 50 grid points. So, the grid system allows you to have a dynamic um, sense of combat. Mm -hmm. For example, um, if your character is well, all your rolls are D20s. So that, that is your starting level, okay? So when you attack, you roll a D20. When you uh, cast a spell, you roll a D20. When you use a skill, all your rolls, if it's skill checks, attacks, combat or not combat, is the same, is D20. When, you, when your character um, suffers damage or loses, um, let's say, his... Um, I don't know how to you... give energy. Mm -hmm. um, the dice drops, it becomes a D12. And that affects everything. Your attack, your skills, everything. Mm -hmm. And then and then there's a third level. That's the, the D10. So you have three dice. One um, common mechanic that affects all of them. And so your dice level uh, dictates your performance. Your grid level dictates dictates your performance so for example let's say that you are uh, on a, i don't know you're on a very uh, simple quest and you enter a dungeon if you don't have a light with you you can suddenly drop to your lowest dice the d10 mm -hmm. so your performance is compromised if you light the lantern you go back to d20 it's a simple advantage and disadvantage mechanic the, uh, with the only difference that you change it between dice and uh, these dice can be affected by the environment or by your health or by your morale so you the, you, you can play with these um, factors uh, in different ways mm -hmm. I don't know if I explained it correctly because uh, my English is uh, a bit uh, <laughs> I don't know, off these days. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 
with the with that in mind, I do recall. I do recall. With the pre with the previous um, iteration of Meteor Tales, something something of an archetype system with within it. Um, at the time, it, at the time, it was a series of subsystems. Is stuff like the Grit system, as well as some of the other stuff in Age of Grit, an attempt to try and um, make things a bit more uniform? Yes, it is more uniform than I. Uh, I got rid of the archetypes slash classes. It's. Uh, I went with the classless approach. It's it's skill based, mm -hmm. more like Grimstone, but more. Uh, refined and I've got a lot more choices um, uh, but I've got some archetypes just for inspiration for example if you want to play an archer or if you want to play a knight uh, I've got a list of skills that are best suited for such an option but you can customize it the way you want yeah now do you have plans on putting in a conversion guide for Sec for between second edition and Age of Grit. Yes, I do, and I wanted your opinion on that because I really want to, and I think it's very simple to do it. I mean, you can, I, c I can convert the adventures, or I can convert uh, anything actually, because um, I don't know. Uh, it seems like um, I don't know a logical thing to do. What is your opinion about that? I, I'm, I'm fully in. In favor of of a conversion guide, if on, if only because when you're de when you're dealing with any sort of any sort of edition or revi or revised, um, you're gonna have you're gonna have people who already have spent some time with the original, True. and they're gonna and instead of want instead of trying to start from scratch, they're gonna want to um, shift things over into the into the new version. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So yeah, I want to do that. Of course, I want to do that. Yeah. Um. And what one thing, th and to the to that particular end, I'm get I'm guessing that a lot of the is the path system still more or less in pl more or less in play, or has there been some significant change to how it worked compared to bef compared to beforehand? Yeah, I I removed the path. I removed the classes altogether. I've got um. I've got um, some schools called domains, actually, mm -hmm. and they contain and they contain skills. And so, when you start a new character or when you level up, you can choose uh, new skills from whatever domain you wish. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, and then there there are some domains that um, uh, are unlocked if you combine uh, other domains. For example. If you you can choose uh, warfare and you can choose magic mm -hmm. and then you can choose uh, stealth and there's also you know a lot of uh, there are different schools like uh, adventuring skills, uh, combat skills, magic skills, uh, craft skills, a bunch of things. But for example, if you combine let's say magic and music, you can unlock bardic combat and you become a bard. Mm -hmm. And then you co if you combine I don't know. Uh, Painting and magic, you can unlock shamanism, and you can, uh, I don't know, perform like you can paint your body with magical paint and stuff like that. Yeah, and since since you're moving into more more of a skill centric approach, have you made that that provides its own advantages and its and its own risks? One of the one of the risks that that can happen because I saw I saw it all the time in the '90s is. Put, is putting in is putting in too many skills or too many prerequisites. Have you taken steps to make sure, especially with your distaste for modifiers, that that does not happen? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, there there are requirements for uh, for skills and their combinations to ensure that you don't have the time in a single campaign to unlock too many stuff. Mm -hmm. For example. Uh, you cannot invest in so many different areas. It, w it just won't happen. Um, I don't know if you remember back in the uh, second edition of Dungeons & Dragons when you could multi-class into two separate classes or three separate classes, stuff like that. But you would be limited by your experience points. So if you had the, 
a character, a paladin, for example, of 20 levels. And then you had a character with, who was like a fighter mage thief. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he would only reach, I don't know, the seventh level of each or something like that. There are ways to lock these things and to limit them. Uh, otherwise, it becomes a circus. Yeah. Uh, you cannot have it. I think that that's what happened in the third edi- edition of Dungeons and Dragons when you could level up in every class every time. Yeah, the, the opposite... Speak, it's funny you mentioned third edition because... Given the prerequis given the use of prerequisites, the there's a similar problem that third edition had that could that could crop up where you ha- where you have um you have so you have prerequisites that are so specific to the point where um your choices in leveling up are kind of a false choice. The whipping boy that mm-hmm. I've always had regarding this was the prerequisites for whirlwind strike, which was a f- yeah. which was a feat that would that would allow you to hit ev- it's um every enemy within range basically pull the spit the spin attack you've seen in every Zelda game since since the second one. Yeah. Um and the the stuff that you have to the stuff that you have to do basically means that just that just to get it you had to plan several levels in advance. Yeah. No, no, no. I don't I don't I don't go into that at all. I don't I don't even like that sort of micromanagement in games. I like the uh atmosphere and I want characters to be invested in the story mm-hmm. and to have a good system, a solid system to play on, but I don't like them thinking about abilities ahead. I don't like them asking me what the abilities are going to be in the next level. I don't like this kind of approach. It's a very video game approach for me. So I don't want them spending time and thought on this. So yeah. prerequisites are not like that. They are just basic stuff. For example, you want to unlock alchemy, you have to invest in medicine and magic because it makes sense. Mm-hmm. For example, uh, first you get the herbs, then you get the spells, and then you get the potions. It's a it's an approach that makes sense. It's a logical um, escalation of things. Uh, I don't like micromanagement that unlock weird maneuvers and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, uh, I've made sure that characters spend, you know, um, skill points to unlock certain stuff that they like in order to uh, create a character, a, a vision they have, to, to support the vision they have for their characters. Uh, that's it. Uh, no, nothing, nothing more than that. Yeah. And from given, given the fact that Given what you mentioned about modifiers, is it is it still a case where you're investing individual mm-hmm. ranks in skills, or you're inve- or are you? Is it a case where you're just um, just inv- just investing that you're trained in a skill? It's more yeah, it's more about training because I wanted to uniform the the game in a way that uh, I tried. I really tried to think why. Um, I mean, it's not easy, for example, to differentiate uh, the damage dealt by a sword or by a dagger. Because if you think about it in real life, both these weapons can kill you very easily. Mm-hmm. And of course, and of course, a punch can, can kill you as well. But it's not the same thing. And I and I had to I had to really sit down and think hard how to make this work and make sense. Because in my mind, it's not about like a dagger does one die four points of damage and the sword does one d8 it's not like that it's not i mean in real life a knife is a very little weapon mm-hmm. and uh and even even a single punch can kill you but how can you difference differentiate all of these things without modifiers and without different dice and so i i had the <laughs> the the idea it came to me and uh, I actually made it work uh, by having the same days for everything, but at the same time differ- differenti- differ- differentiating them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it all comes down to having a little system, because again, we have a little system. And uh, when you have a little system, 
you make sure that weapons are, are all effective and all dangerous. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second step was to have a different parameter, which is called critical. So all weapons, for example, and spells have different critical ranges. Mm -hmm. For example, a longsword has a critical hit when you score 17 or higher in the D20. Mm -hmm. But a dagger has a critical range of 19. So, for example, yes, it's faster, but it has a, um, a worse critical range, for example. Yeah. And when it, for me, when it, when it comes to the long, the long sword and, da and dagger difference, um, I was always of the opinion that when differentiating them just by how much damage they do... Um, it means that the only reason you'd equip a equip a dagger is if you can't afford a long sword. Yeah, no, whereas, that's not the case. <laughs> whereas both of the, whereas both of them are going to ha are going to have their are going to have their use in rea mm -hmm. in reality, because mm -hmm. well, some places are going to be too cr are going to be too crowded for it. I remember the dark eye having a um, reach system where. In open areas, the weapon with bigger reach gets advantage. In more confined areas, um, or more confined ranges, it's the uh, reach works against you. So if you get, if you ha if at certain, if your opponent's at a certain range and you've got say a um, halberd, the halberd is going to have advantage. But if they're in real close, the halberd is going to have disadvantage. Sure. Um, um, I've got similar mechanics for my weapons to make them balanced because I, I always hated that people started the campaign with a single weapon and never changed because they didn't have any reason to. Mm -hmm. uh, but now there's plenty of reason to choose uh, reasons to, to choose a dagger over a longsword. Okay, for, so for example, the critical range is, uh, is different here, so the longsword is superior to the dagger in terms of damage. Sure. Mm -hmm. But the dagger is small and you can... Um, draw it from your uh, quick belt without uh, spending an action. So that's an advantage for the dagger. Also, it's very small, so when you attack a, per a target from close quarters, the, the other target has a disadvantage in defense. So uh, he will roll uh, smaller dice to defend. Mm. Uh, it's stuff like that. It's stuff like that, and it's, and it's many things for every weapon. So every weapon is very different. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the idea the idea of combat styles, um, yeah, that's something that I'm always I'm always interested in because I don't I've never been fond of of a one size fits all when it comes to how when it comes to how um, martial based characters fight. Yep. Uh, and I've even in even some of my even in some of my other stuff I've encouraged. People to think about where they where they learned how if it was from a school or if it was self taught or what or whatnot. Yep. So with com with um combat styles, I believe I believe you have it that that's one of the do that's one of the domains. Um, yeah. What separates what separates the combat style domain from say warfare? Um, the combat styles. Uh... You 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 must first pick a combat style to unlock the warfare domain. Mm -hmm. So, combat styles is the weapons you can use. For example, one combat style is light melee weapons. You choose that, and you can effectively use small melee weapons. Uh, I mean, light melee weapons like swords, daggers, etc. Another combat style is archery. You can use bows, etc. If you don't have that skill, you can use it. Uh, with a disadvantage, which, which means you can only use the D10 roll to attack and defend. Mm -hmm. If you invest a point and get the skill, you can use a D20. It unlocks the good dice and it unlocks the warfare domain. Uh, when And then you can specialize further. For example, you choose your combat style, let's say light melee weapons, and then you get to warfare, and you can choose between a number of subdomains like offense, defense, uh, mobility, technique, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then 
you can spend points there however you like to actually customize the way you fight if you are more uh, of an offensive uh, fighter or you are more a mobile ca character or a technique you base your your, your, tec um, your strength on technique mm -hmm. or mere strength and stuff like that so you get different maneuvers and combos that's it yeah um now a lot of those a lot of those i can kind of put two and two together what does technique entail if if somebody focused on technique in their fighting style what would what would that lead okay. into oh, i will make a very simple exam example so if you the first maneuver of the offense subdomain for example is a combo that allows you to perform a single action that deals regular damage uh, combined with a knockdown effect for example if uh, the equivalent of the technique uh, first maneuver would be a regular attack combined with a disarm uh, effect. So it's a different approach. Uh, a disarm maneuver is a technique based where a knockdown maneuver, for example, could be uh, in the offense. It's small things that make your character different as a he progresses in, uh, in experience. So the, uh, if you spend more points in technique, you'll get maneuvers that have some sort of finesse. Some, uh, they are more dexterity-based. They have effects like that, you know, that avail this weapon style. Yeah. So going, going, on, from that, going on from that... Uh... I'd like to go, I'd like to go into the whole the whole notion of modular magic as is as is mentioned. Um, yeah. Is is it a case where you, where getting certain domains will unlock will unlock the um some some of the parts of mo of this modular approach or is it a case where they unlock a package? Well, um each point you spend per level, you can, you know, you can take one more element, you can unlock one more element. Mm -hmm. And so, in, in essence, you have two categories. You have shapes, when it comes to magic, you have shapes and you have variations or effects, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, the idea is that you combine shapes and effects and you make um, uh, different spells. Mm -hmm. For example... Um, a shape is a bolt, and, and another shape is a wall. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and then an, and an effect a variation is a is a fire, and another variation uh, is let's say I will not say ice, which is too obvious. I will say light, which is a bit different. Um, so, if you combine these effects together, you you get a fire bolt and a fire wall. Okay. And on the other hand, you have a light bolt and a light wall. Do you see where this is going? Mm -hmm. So yeah, if a, if, a, if a target moves through the fire wall, it suffers, I don't know, fire damage. But if it walks through a light wall, it gets illuminated. Mm -hmm. And so you've got like 10 shapes and, uh, and 10 variations. But within these combinations, you have hundreds of a different spells. Yeah. And given the given the unified appro approach, um, what what sort of restrictor do you have in mind when it comes to when it comes to spell use? Is it a case of um, spell use tires you out? Is it a case where you have a resource that you're drawing from? Um, what's oh, yeah. the approach? I've got the same mechanic that I use for physical combat as well. Everything in Metal Tales: Age of Grit comes down to uh, high risk, high reward, low risk, low reward. So whenever you perform a, man a maneuver or cast a spell, you have a factor called risk. It's not mana points, it's not memorization, it's not stamina, it's nothing like that. It's just risk, mm -hmm. which means that uh, the more powerful the spell or the maneuver, the higher the risk. So what is risk? If you roll into the risk zone, you uh, you fail. And failure means you lose your action. And also, you drop to the lowest dice for the current round. For example, 
let's say that a fireball spell has a risk of 5. You roll a d20. If you roll 1 to 5, you fall into the risk zone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, a flame wave spell has a risk of 10. It's the same thing. It's the same principle. So you are, you are free to cast whatever you want or try to cast whatever you want or perform the most complicated maneuver ever, but you risk more. And if you risk more, it's unlikely that you fall into the risk zone and you become very vulnerable for the rest of the round. Mm-hmm. So, now what now? Um, in second edition, you ha- you had a um, you had a location based system regarding wounds. Do you still have that, or or is that something that also got unified? No, no, it got unified as well. You have a single bar called grit, mm-hmm. and you start with fifty grit points. Yep. Again, I remind you that it's it's not only hit points; it's hit points, morale, everything. Yeah. So. Uh, for example, you fight another character, he attacks you and he rolls a d20. Note that damage is a d20, it's a lot of damage because you only have 50 points. Mm-hmm. So, uh, let's say that you suffer 15 points of damage, you, you, you drop to 35. So far, so good. So, uh, you don't have any location-based uh, attacks and stuff like that. You have a common pool like hit points, as I said. That is your grit points. Mm-hmm. If you if you drop to twenty grit points, it's the first threshold, and then you go one dice category down. Your attacks drop to D twelve, so your performance is compromised. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if I attack you again with a D twenty, you have to defend yourself with a D twelve, so you have a disadvantage. And if you dr- drop further below, uh, you go to D10. So you have this mechanic everywhere. Mm-hmm. And to the now to that part- to that particular end, uh, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that no matter how str- how, ma- how high level or low level the campaign is, uh, all roads, po- all roads point to characters always having 50 grit points at the start? Yeah, I, 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 they progress a bit. I mean, when they reach like, I don't know, 10 and 20 level, they get a plus 10 bonus. I mean, a master character can have like 70 grit points, but that's it. It's not a much of a difference, but it's a bit, you know, just a small advantage over inexperienced ones. Mm-hmm. So, yes, it's, uh, for example... Right before our interview, we were having a session, and the characters are now like 15 level, which is very high if you think about it. And uh, their grid levels are like that, 70. And they were fighting monsters that they used to fight in earlier levels as well, and they're still difficult. Not the same, mm-hmm. but but very little. Uh, uh, again, I mean, it doesn't change a lot. They are always you know, uh, alert. You know, because little systems are like that. You're never too safe. You get skills and maneuvers and spells to defend yourself better, but not when it comes to damage. Yeah. Now, in that reg- in that regard, what what would the what would the effects of armor be? Would it just would it just um reduce would it just reduce how much how much um reduction to grit you take from physical damage? Uh, actually, two things. It's yes, it's damage reduction. That's one thing, but the main thing, and that goes for heavy armors, metallic armors, is uh, critical resistance. For example, I don't know if a um, if a troll attacks you and it gets critical damage from fifteen or higher in the D twenty dice. Mm-hmm. Maybe a plate mail armor gives you a critical resistance of three, so it needs to roll eighteen or higher to achieve a critical attack. So critical resistance is the most crucial uh, benefit of armor, apart from damage reduction. Mm-hmm. And wh- now one other th- one other thing that I c- that I couldn't help but notice with the with the um, char- when I looked at the character sheet. On the on the Kickstarter page is there's sti- there's is the the whole the whole notion of um, 
on on structure attributes the range of very low to legendary um what w what does that necessarily entail in terms of when in terms of when you're rolling yeah um if you notice um regardless of your uh, of, of your attribute level if you have low or high uh, mobility for example mm -hmm. uh, regardless of that you have three categories in each i mean you the, the the concept is that the attributes are dynamic. So, for example, let's say you have medium mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't get... Uh, I, I will make an example um, to make it easier for uh, people that listen to us to understand. Let's say that you had strength in Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, if you had, like, I don't know, you could have, like, 12 in strength, Okay? If, if you translate that into Metro Tales language, you would have uh, three values instead of one. You would, you would have 12, uh, 10, and 8. And these uh, values change in combat if you suffer damage. So your performan performance drops. Uh, all right, I, get, I can get that. So if you if you if you move like I don't know ten feet per round, uh, if you suffer damage, and then you move five feet per round, for example. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, I also saw the personality um, motif, which personality was it was in was in second edition, but um, I but I noticed that there aren't as I... me as many <laughs> entries. Yeah. Is... It's a different approach. Mm -hmm. It's a different approach. Um, in this system, personal the personality system is something that I um, I don't allow players to choose. I appoint them to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you start the character, you have zero personality because you don't know what exactly you're going for. Let's say, but at the end of each session, I assign the personality point to each character uh, according to the things they did. Uh, in game so for example if you do something really brave in game you will get a bravery point mm -hmm. and uh, if you do something really greedy you will get a greed point so you get these points and when you reach a certain threshold for example five points something happens either good or bad mm -hmm. you get a bonus you get a penalty uh, the whole purpose of the personality system is not to reward players or to punish them. It is to, um, how do you say? It is to actually connect the actions of the characters uh, and the, um, I don't know, the intentions of the players. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, um, there are other mechanisms to reward role playing. And to reward uh, you know the classic mechanics, uh, the personality system is um, how the um, is actually to materialize the actions players in mechanics, mm -hmm. the actions uh, actions in mechanics, the players actions in mechanics. That's what I wanted to say. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> now, with the with that in with that in mind, when it comes to what are you shooting for as far as a as far as a pay, as far as a page count for at, at the very least book of heroes yeah it's a uh, book of heroes is ready actually mm -hmm. i'm on the final I'm, I'm on the final review of everything so mm -hmm. uh, i'm only i don't know correcting some typos or changing a few abilities stuff like that but the uh the layout is ready everything is ready uh i'm about uh, i don't know a month from now i think i'm gonna be shipping everything um so the length of the book i could tell you exactly to be honest is uh let me see the book of heroes which is the main book of course um would be 218 pages no nope, 220 mm -hmm. 20 pages which it is cer is certainly is certainly I would say it's smaller than 
than second edition, but you combine that with Book of Monsters, and it probably amounts to the mm -hmm. same. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Or an, or a similar page count. Which speaking of which speaking of that, I do find it interesting that you ha that you have it planned to do this. You have things planned to do this multi multi um multi pit multi book setup. Yep. Uh, so I believe I believe you the way you have it is book of he book of heroes, um, book of monsters, um, book of broken tales, book of Adve book of adventures, and book of lore. Um, yeah. What would the latter three in those entail? So, uh, which one should we uh, begin with? Um, Book of Broken Tales. Book of Broken Tales is very easy. It's uh, a collection of standalone quests. Mm -hmm. So you can. It's just each spread has a quest, and you help game masters navigate the game uh, with different uh, quests that. Uh, you know, uh, they're very easy to follow. They've got a dungeon and stuff like that, but everything fits in a spread. Mm -hmm. So the Book of Broken Tales is a collection of quests. Yeah. Um, what about Book of Adventures? Book of Adventures is, is a single campaign because it's it's Book of Adventures, uh, subtitled Treasures of Dragon Isle. So we, we have the first official Age of Great Adventure. Um, uh, so it's a full adventure with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. And book of and book of lore is the lore book for Vit for Vitalia. Yes, I finally finally managed to uh, put all of the world in a single book. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, of course, I I expand on these concepts uh, through World Anvil, the online platform, because it's impossible to contain everything in a single book. But I've got all of the locations of the world map. Mm -hmm. All of the cities, uh, and each location has a different encounter table and some information. So a game master can take this book, and he can use it to play an open world campaign and go from uh, location A to location B and travel everywhere in the world with basic information and different monsters in each location. So you can play. You know, I always like the open world approach. I don't like locations being uh, you know. Uh, modified according to the power of the to the experience level of the party so if you go to a place where dragons live you're gonna face dragons mm -hmm. so you get the book of law you got you you get the uh, idiosyncrasies of the world you get all these different weather phenomena how you can play in the world of vitalia how you can deal with the weather and all these different effects you've got the different locations you can also choose some more playable races uh, from the world of Italia, there are also a bit, uh, a few extra skills and skill trees and artifacts and weapons and magical items. You've got all of this information. To be um, more precise, the Book of Law is the largest of all the books. It's like 300 something pages. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing with that information, it could, the, bo the Book of Law could be used to do. Um... To do to do ah to do a more hex crawl like of like approach to a exactly. campaign exactly I, I love this kind of gaming yes and I I can certainly I can certainly see that uh, now with that with that in mind what are you shooting for as far as a release window for Age of Grit at least for the first two uh books. I will uh, no no I I work on the, on them at the same time all of them mm -hmm. so I'm gonna ship all of them before June that's that is my I mean the Kickstarter campaign says June but I aim to do that in May latest mm -hmm. I work on them tirelessly tirelessly every day I better test them every day mm -hmm. I I am on the process of fine tuning now and just reviewing stuff. All right, I I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that. So fingers with, crossed. Yep. <laughs> yeah, with with all that with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness once again. I always I always like having you on. Thank you very much. I always enjoy talking to you about this mm -hmm. stuff. 
And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you very much. And of, and of course, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!